ci dovrà eh, per cominciare. Ok. So Cristina told us that, uh, that we can go. Uh, hello everybody and thank you uh, to you for your participation in this uh, webinar. May I ask uh, Cristina to show uh, my first file presentation? That's fine. Thank you very much. And to the participant, uh, I just uh, as a first, uh, uh, as a first, I want to uh, introduce you to the panel of experts, to the presenter uh, here for you, available for you for this uh, webinar on learning space. Uh, just uh, starting from myself, uh, my name is uh, Elena Calderola from University of Pavia. At my right side here, Professor Marco Morandotti, um, Vice Rector for Real Estate at University of Pavia. And uh, please, Marco. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and um, hello to everybody and see you in a few minutes. And uh, on my uh, left side, uh, Professor Stefano Govoni, uh, Vice Rector uh, at the University of uh, Pavia, Professor in uh, Pharmacology and uh, Expert in uh, Alzheimer's Disease. Okay, <laughs> good afternoon to everybody. And I'm here indeed uh, as a Delegate or Director for Teaching Activities in the University. And uh, in the other camera, camera my colleagues, uh, Mats Kulled from uh, Uppsala University, Sweden. And thank you very much, much to Mats for his uh, contribution and participation in uh, this seminar about uh, learning space. Mats, maybe you want to say just some words about yourself? Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, Mats Kulled from Uppsala University, Sweden, right to the north of Stockholm. Uh, where I am employed as educational developer and I've spent uh, a large part of my professional life at least the last few years in one the experimental classroom of Uppsala University helping teachers pro developing their teaching there. Right over here. Okay, thank you much. Uh, only some, just a few minutes because Marco, please, can you give me, uh, okay, yeah, because sure. I want... Okay, just that's fine. Okay, uh, so we can uh, start uh, uh, our uh, webinar with the, the first presentation, a, sh a short introduction, just uh, to uh, setting the scene. And uh, the title of this webinar is uh, New Learning Spaces to Support the uh, EU 2020 Learning Intensive Society. Uh, maybe you can think uh, that it's a quite complicated uh, and uh, a lot articulated the title. Maybe you are right. <laughs> so it is my pleasure now just to start this presentation uh, with some <coughs> reflection and putting on the table some concept, some themes, some concept in order just to start with an uh, active learning participation. So. Just in some minutes, we will see some presentation about learning space, but as you can see from the title, there are a lot of very interesting terms and topics and concepts so articulated and so wide. Uh, we, will, we are talking about uh, learning, that is education. We are talking about spaces and uh, generally speaking environments in which uh, education takes place. We are talking about society, and in this case, for society, I mean a, a project, uh, a project about this society, which society and which, which project of this society, and the perspectives of a society. And even if in the title is not mentioned the concept of technology, Anyway, the concept of technologies, as you can understand, as you can imagine, underlines uh, the spaces, underlines the learning, underlines the spaces, underlines the society in which we live. Why this? So go to the next slide. So just as a joke, uh, you can see here uh, represented a forest. 
and this is a forest of mangroves. And uh, I like uh, to define this forest, the realm of mangroves. Why this? Uh, some months ago, I was in Udine, at the University of Udine in Italy, and uh, I had the opportunity uh, to listen to a very brilliant and interesting presentation from Professor uh, Luciano uh, Floridi, a distinguished uh, philosopher at Oxford University. And he had a very interesting uh, view of the uh, uh, society in which we live because he asked uh, to the audience, in this moment, are you on life, on, online or on, are you offline? Uh, it is hard uh, to have uh, the correct answer because nowadays it is not possible, it is no more possible to say if we are online or we are offline, since we live in a society that is in a, in a, in a kind of on the middle. That is, according to this definition, we live in a sort of infosphere where the state of each of us is on life. So no more online, no more offline, but on life. We are on life. And like an image, just to have a picture about, about this state, uh, Luciano Floridi uh, gave us this kind of image that is the mangroves, where the mangroves flourish. They flourish when, where the river meets the sea. And so you have no more sweet water, no more salty water, but brackish water. So this is the real of, of mangroves, and this is the society in which we live on, on life. And so we live in a such kind of infosphere. And what is our human project for the digital age? Because at the present, the real challenge is no longer to think about digital innovation, this is a fact, but the governance of the digital. So for me, and uh, for just to start and to begin, and just to have a big picture of, of, or a framework of this webinar, this is the big picture. The big picture is the infosphere in which we are living. But having a joke another time, just to mix uh, the words uh, included in the, ti in the title, um, may, may I uh, represent you a famous sentence from uh, John Dewey, John Dewey, <coughs> John Dewey sorry, a distinguished um, pedagogist uh, um, of, um, of the previous uh, um, century. And a, a famous sentence is, the conception of education as a social process and function has no defined meaning until we define the kind of society we have in mind. So look at the, at the title of the webinar. We are talking about education and we are talking about the society that uh, John Dewey strictly related in this kind of links. So we have to think uh, about uh, education as a, a way to promote or not promote uh, a special kind of society. So since we all live in higher education and we try to uh, build uh, learning spaces just to promote, to foster a kind of education, which kind of education for which kind of society? And another, and another time, which kind of society we have in mind for future generations? And again, thank you very much, Christina. And again, Henri Lefebvre, uh, one of the um, more distinguished uh, sociologists uh, about uh, the conception and the production of space. Another very interesting uh, uh, sentence. Space is not a scientific <clears throat> object removed from ideology or politics. It has always been political and strategic. Space, which seems homogeneous, which appears as a wall in its objectivity, 
in its pure form, such as we determine it, is a social product. That is, when and how uh, a society uses the space, this defines a kind of power <coughs> of a ruling class in order to define how the society has uh, to develop for the future. So in this case, we can focus on the relation between space and society. So another, another time, you can look at the title, and we are talking about which kind of society and which kind of spaces to use in order to foster which kind of society. So another time, we have links between concepts uh, included in the, in the title. And again, space and education, that is, in other words, the way in which a space is designed shapes the learning that takes place in that space. Between, in, in a space, first of all, you have relationship and kind of relationship and different kind of relationship between the stakeholder that that space are living together. And uh, according to this other uh, distinguished scholar, Professor Rudd, the idea is um, the question is no more what buildings do we want, but instead what sort of education do we want to see in the future? <coughs> and not how many classrooms do we need, but what sorts of learning relationship do we want to foster in that space for which kind of education? What competencies do we want learners to develop? What tools and what resources are available to us to support learning? So another time, I am joking, of course, I am trying to link uh, to, to different uh, concepts and terms, space and education. So, you will remember that at the beginning of my presentation, the word technologies was in gray and not in, in black like the other one. But it is like an hidden guest, but it is so powerful at the present in our age. Technology, technology related to space. Uh, I think that is quite unuseful to explain you the concept of cloud computing, but there is another space that we cannot define where is this space. Elsewhere, in a lot of computers and databases spread everywhere in the world. And from the other side, we have Internet of Things, that is a sort of network of a database and data coming from things that we have with us, uh, accompanying us in each moment of our lives. I think that uh, thinking and the concept of Internet of Things is very, very uh, easy uh, to recall the concept uh, at the beginning of uh, Luciano Floridi, that is, we are now online or we are offline. We don't know, because in every moment of our life, uh, there is something of our life appearing in a database elsewhere in the world through this concept of Internet of Things. And just to finish and arriving to the concept of learning space. So, according to Wikipedia, learning space refers to a physical setting for a learning environment, a place, in which teaching and learning occur, and is okay, the term is commonly used as a more definitive alternative to classroom, but it may also refer to an indoor or outdoor location, either actual or virtual. So you can understand now what kind of mixing that we have in real spaces or virtual spaces creating a big learning spaces in which relation goes together. 
Learning spaces are highly diverse in use, in learning styles, configuration, location, education institution, and they support a variety of pedagogies, including normal study, passive or active learning. It depends from the relations, in which it depends from the role of the um, teacher. Kinesthetic or physical learning, vocational, experiential, and others. And just to come to the end of this very short introduction, learning spaces, uh, we have to look at them as a way to embrace a different view of future learning and, as a consequence, a different view for the future society and a different view in order to conceive spaces in which social relay, relay, uh, relations happen. So maybe a lot of concept, a lot of reflection, a, a lot of provoking <laughs> maybe aspect, a like point of view uh, were presented in this uh, short uh, introduction. And uh, for this reason, now we come and let's explore the tangled realm of mangroves. And I leave the floor uh, to Stefano Govoni. OK. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, and as I said before, I am the um, teaching, uh, uh, the delegate for teaching activities of the uh, university. So we heard a lot of ideas uh, and beautiful ideas, but I have to think how to put this in practice. And let me give you, provide you some numbers. Uh, uh, Pavia has 23,000 students and 44 master degree, 43 bachelor degrees, and uh, classrooms uh, uh, from uh, 20 to 300 students. So you have to imagine how to try to transform this concept in something that can be delivered to the students, and involve the students, and also the teachers. And let me start with the first slide, uh, the elephant. <laughs> Why the elephant? But indeed, this is the uh, Pavia University Museum. And uh, uh, there is an elephant that was donated by Napoleon in uh, uh, 1812. Uh, and he's there as a testimony or uh, witnessing a certain period of the university when natural history was uh, uh, one of the main topics uh, and there are so many samples that a museum will be around and actually uh, Marco <laughs> built yeah. the, the museum. But for me the elephant has also another meaning which is uh, the elephant is the old-fashioned classroom and teaching relationship. Let me underscore it with some sentences. One master, many students, sometimes hundreds. We have classrooms of over 200 students. Pre digested information, no discussion. Learn whatever is provided to you and exactly as it, it has been presented. You, students, are numbers among many equal to you, and all of you must reach the same standard knowledge at the same times. Uh, no outliers allowed, either the gifted one or the less able one, but no outliers. Everyone at the same pace in time. Uh, this is the elephant sitting in our classroom, the old-fashioned way of thinking, teaching and learning. I have the uh, next one. Yeah. And uh, uh, 
as you may see uh, from uh, uh, the, the slides, what we uh, tried to, to reason about this uh, problem was, uh, uh, try, uh, was the attempt to think how our tra traditional organization can be uh, modified. How can we remove the elephant from the uh, classroom? Among this, we may change the space, but we have to also to change the people, uh, either from the teaching side and from uh, the student side, uh, in order uh, to, to proceed with a true learning space. And uh, I'm aware, and uh, Ellen already said, that the space can have an impact on learning. Uh, there is one initial problem, and it will be recalled also in the further slides, numbers. It's difficult to think to a learning space for a couple of hundred of people. So we have to change the structure of our classroom. Space can bring people together, but also encourage exploration, collaboration, and discussion. We need very much more discussion between teachers and students and within the students in our classrooms. Space may help to define the borders and the method that the teacher uses uh, at the university. And later on, I will speak about also on the colleges. Uh, and I realized that, however, there were resistance in the next uh, uh, slide. Because uh, to uh, bring a change is difficult. This is taken from a 2014 document saying that the resistance to change is absorbed in higher education organizations as well as in other uh, large organizations. Uh, measure disruptive changes that lead to new business model, produce new definitions of value and quality, and uh, most of the traditional organization, even if successful or because they were successful or are successful, are unwilling to embrace uh, a change until the customer really do manifest an, an uh, increasing uh, demand for the uh, new uh, way, new value offering. And as is shown in uh, uh, the next one, bringing a change needs a lot of work. Uh, and with top down, bottom up, uh, double uh, arrow, I do mean that uh, this work may start with a top-down decision, as it, was in, as it was in Pavia, starting with the first uh, uh, new learning spaces built uh, up in our university. But it needs participations and it needs the feedback or the information from the uh, people using these spaces. You need to prepare the change, to explain, to reduce uncertainty, to create consensus. And I can tell you that is a, a, real, a really a demanding job. You need leaders. Uh, uh, you need to find people that in each department will lead the change if that department uh, will host a new learning space. You need to involve both teachers and students. Uh, you have to find a way to create a reward and uh, in this way to uh, uh, drive the change. Next one, please. There are also external difficulties. And these are the accreditation constraints and rules 
uh, that uh, um, are everywhere, and I would say particularly in Italy. We need a new set of rules. What are the teaching hours? How do we calculate the teaching hours for the new learning spaces and methods? What are the class timings? What are the class dimension on which we should work in order to have an efficacious uh, learning space? And in the next one, please, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, um, next one also. Yeah. And the challenges that we had to face here in Italy are those that I just mentioned. Plus, whatever the, our Ministry of, Things, uh, of University, uh, ask to the university to respect. Uh, for example, in here we have a division of for each discipline, uh, a number of hours or credit that are pre-established by government rules. Uh, they're all rules that make very difficult to uh, build up a free or a more free program but we have to comply, otherwise our courses will not receive credit. And backwards one, uh, what we uh, uh, did in uh, uh, Pavia was uh, uh, to start with some low cost or relatively uh, low cost, uh, I would say within 100,000 euros, uh, initiatives and set a more long and uh, standing and strong commitment for the uh, future with a sustainable investment plan for uh, disseminating the initial experience throughout the university to more in yeah. uh, advance. Uh, technology aided teaching but it's not matter of just matter of technology. Uh, next one, and uh, uh, there are uh, uh, problems that you have to solve with both teachers and students. Teacher side, as shown in the slide, for example, familiarity with the use of the new communication technologies. Uh, but also, and with the help of the modified learning space, transition from a masterful to an influential and in, uh, coaching teaching. I'm not the boss of the classroom and you just obey. I'm not the master, the commander. But we have to work together and I have to be convincing influential. I have to be the coach of the learning team that includes myself and the students. And this, and this can be uh, taught. Uh, we are now a program for uh, um, instructing and uh, uh, the teachers to both new technologies and new ways of teaching. And we'll start in uh, December this year. The student side, the lack of familiarity with the new teaching, learning methods and goals. Because uh, also the student come to the university with an old fashioned uh, hierarchical understanding of the approach to the teacher. They are not accustomed to discuss the teacher's statements. Uh, I have, uh, I'm teaching pharmacology to a class of 80 people and I have difficulties in having questions, open questions. And as soon as I finish the lesson, uh, there are many people coming and asking, 
But professor, what do you think about can you do and are all interesting? Wonderful question. But they are afraid to to put it uh, uh, in front of uh, all the class. So also the students have to change their mind. Next one. Obviously, there are a, a series of challenges, including also the financial challenges. So you have to uh, program. You, do, you need money, but not money just for the uh, new technology, but also to have uh, uh, instruction uh, and teaching classes for the teachers, uh, but also money to have uh, uh, more uh, tutor, more activity of tutoring. Uh, you need money to have more teacher to diminish the class dimension, and this is very difficult in, uh, in Italy, or you have to multiply the turn uh, uh, I can teach uh, 30 students but I have uh, 300 so I must repeat 10 times whatever I'm teaching next one I'm going uh, uh, near to uh, finish so my central thinking is that uh, learning not leaning, but learning space is not just a new classroom. It is a either real or virtual space, but <coughs> that should facilitate the development of personalized, personalized learning. Uh, the development of individual intelle intellectual identities the development of personal skills, but at the same time, uh, it should teach uh, to the person uh, how to reach a consensus in a solution. So you must develop yourself individually as a person, but become ready to integrate within the group and to contribute to a common uh, solution with, over which there is the uh, consensus among the group. Next one, and this is the last one. Uh, this is particular for Pavia and just for Pavia. We have a college system with uh, 2,500 residents in the colleges. And my idea is that colleges should be learning spaces. Indeed, they already are in part learning spaces, but we may improve this vocation of the colleges to be. Uh, learning spaces. We have to enlarge the idea and you may be a college member even if you don't reside in that college but you have an uh, idea, brand identity that will help you to share knowledge in an environment like the one of the colleges in which many disciplines are represented. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano, for your uh, presentation and uh, above all for having represented uh, uh, problems and uh, perspective not only from uh, Italy's situation but in a wider uh, perspective. Um, I can see from your presentation that, of course, uh, some terms uh, come up uh, in order to, if I want to highlight what kind of skills and what kind of society and what kind of education that we want to foster uh, together higher education institution, uh, teacher and student mm -hmm. in order to the, provide a better result uh, and a better product uh, 
uh, from our university and our institutions. So uh, I, I really think uh, that your uh, contribution is, is very important in order to fix uh, this uh, situation. Yeah. Also the idea that not everyone has the same timing of learning. Absolutely, absolutely, Stefan, absolutely. Um, there is a, a question from uh, Monica Hermanescu, uh, Timisoara, and uh, she said, are the accreditation constraints the problem or the minimum criteria for accreditation? We need clear standards also for e-learning in uh, way countries. Flexibility must not negatively influence the personal skills of the student Provided by the proved by diploma. I don't know if you maybe want to have a comment. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree on the uh, last statement, uh, but uh, the uh, constraints are uh, in the case of Italy uh, very uh, peculiar. We have uh, an institution which is called in Italian. Settore scientifico disciplinare uh, that uh, means I'm a pharmacologist, I'm belonging to the uh, bio 14 sector, and I should have within the pharmacy course at least so much credits. And if a student uh, want to uh, have uh, some credits in therapeutics, uh, uh, it may be difficult. So we have to learn how to use as maximum as possible the uh, flexibility of the system. Uh, and I uh, will agree that we should uh, convene, but at Europe level, not at local level, what was what is the uh, minimum set of skills and knowledge which is needed for certain uh, uh, professions or activities uh, particularly uh, for example in the health system uh, area but also in others I, I saw that there was something, but I cannot read. No, no, I, I read for you. Don't, okay. <laughs> no, don't worry, Stefano. Thank you very much nice. uh, to Stefano and also to Monica for uh, the questions. And um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cristina, for uh, your comment. And uh, now I leave the floor to Professor Marco Morandotti, uh, Deputy Rector for uh, uh, Real Estate uh, in Pavia University. Please, Marco. Okay. Thank you, Elena. Um, may I yes, use? of course. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if you want, I can click for you, and you are free okay. to talk. Let's let's try okay. <laughs> how it how it goes. Uh, so, uh, hello to everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to share with such a wide and international audience uh, a topic which is uh, really uh, complex, as a matter of fact, uh, which is. Uh, thank you. I try to do it by myself, but I think it's better <laughs> yeah. that the chief so of operations still free, remains. You are free okay, to talk. To talk. And and it's, I think yes, it's yes. enough. Concentrate on uh, your question. Okay. Um, so let's go. Uh, the question uh, was, in, in a few words, um, how it is possible to plan and build and in any way develop learning studies for the learning society in historical buildings? And of course, uh, uh, I think it is a, a central question and a central topic in the wider context of the European Distance Learning Week, in the context we are speaking about, and in the perspective of uh, 2020 society, as Elena stated uh, before. We can uh, go, of course, uh, the topic deals, uh, to me at least, uh, uh, with the idea of complexity, of what universities are becoming and are transforming their own identities and rules among the society, which is at the same time changing itself. And so it's uh, an integrated complex of topics in which we can consider, at least uh, uh, today, uh, for this speech, university almost in the center, but not exactly uh, in a really specific center, because many other 
drivers of change are happening in different skills of people attending universities and also in different perspectives of social developing, of course. So what we can do is I mean, Okay. okay. Um, for instance, at least to me, in the perspective of these uh, last five years, uh, the question is uh, why it is a strategic key, the building infrastructure management of universities in a such dynamic and changing scenario. Please go on. Uh, I think it is uh, due, the relevance of this topic, at least uh, to three main uh, um, rules or reasons. The first one is the symbolic value of the heritage of the real estate of each university. We cannot forget that the University of Pavia is an historical university placed inside an historical town and this also put all the context in a much more difficult approach because what we uh, have to do is to deal with historical buildings, many of which are protected by uh, heritage rules. Uh, and so the constraints in which Stefano was speaking about from uh, a legal point of view in terms of uh, articulation of didactic uh, offers are ex exactly the same from a building uh, point of view. But also, of course, there is a strength because an heritage uh, a building heritage of high quality has a really huge symbolic value that has to be protected and preserved by the university. And also the second reason is that we have to follow and try to, um, to, to stay uh, on the same level of user requirements that are really, really quickly um, growing in the last years. What we was used to think that it was enough for students 30 years ago is no more enough for students of nowadays. They are expecting many more um, performances by the buildings, by the system, by the integrated uh, network of resources, human and technological, that they are involved in. So uh, we have to follow a continuous upgrading process. And also, uh, we, we face um, the dialogue and the dialectic between the necessity to increase standards of our spaces versus the transformation limits that these spaces has, as they are historical ones. And I just put three uh, short points, for instance, accessibility, safety, and security, energy efficiency, all of these are um, pushing us to improve our buildings and each of them ask us to find a way, a path, a sustainable path to do so in a, a huge quality historical environment. And first and third, there are new activities. And universities are mostly opening to what we call third mission, something that not deals exactly with didactic or research. Uh, Stefano started his brilliant presentation speaking about museums. Museums is a good example to me of spaces that may be involved in spaces of the universities, but are not exactly what we thought about the university 100 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, but we can start uh, to speak about startup and spin off or other mixed function spaces. So, of course, the next, uh, I will focus our attention to, please, Elena, if yes. it works, okay, oh. about users' requirements and uh, the new standards of existing spaces because I think that this fits quite well also with the idea of how to transform existing spaces into learning spaces. So the next one. Uh, of course, as we have already stressed, we can sp speak in, uh, uh, about <laughs> learning and space <laughs> together yeah. with two different epistemological categories yeah. Yeah. because, yeah. of course, uh, space, whatever physical or even virtual, uh, can have an impact on learning. Uh, usually it has uh, an impact on learning. It can bring people together and can encourage exploration of common spaces, collaboration and discussion, or on the opposite, it can make this really difficult to do. And oh, okay. oh, no, a, a back, little back, back sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, not only the space, but also the learning 
is changing its rules and the meaning of what we think about learning, which is a difference from teaching, as we already stressed. And if learning is not confined to scheduled classrooms, spaces and times, the whole campus, uh, anywhere and at any time, the infosphere, Elena yeah, was speaking yeah, before, is potentially an effective learning space. These two statements are taken by literature about learning space, I think, that clarify how complex is uh, the scenario, which is both complex in the society, connected or not, uh, online or on life, but also in the university. The next one. And I think, of course, we can uh, make an exercise applying the five rules of the journalistic uh, yeah. uh, um, approach. approach. <laughs> Who, what, when, where, and why, and also maybe also adding how. And in bold, uh, <laughs> here I have stressed two of that five who, what and where, yeah, yeah. that maybe probably fits a little better. But of course, who means uh, who are the users of the learning space. Yeah. So it is absolutely a central topic, a central topic itself, because we, if we do not understand who uh, will use that spaces, it's really difficult for us to design correctly yeah. that. And of course, what learning spaces are where that there can be place and in these ways absolutely connected to how we can transform existing spaces in this. So uh, to me, the next one, please. Um, it is uh, from a, some circumstances a, a really interesting challenge because as my um, main research interest as professor here at the University of Pavia is uh, um, building technologies for the cultural heritage of restoration of building, we have also uh, worked in the last years about a kind of holistic approach, what we, we call in our research is life cycle oriented restoration approach, uh, which try to, um, to take into consideration in the same way three main theoretical pillars for restoration, which is functional sustainability, energy oriented sustainability and life cycle oriented sustainability the next one uh, of course today uh, what we are speaking about just fits exactly with one of these three pillars which is functional sustainability and so the relation the relations between building and function of course if function is going to change yeah. and change i think is definitely a key word um, stefano uh, told us about resistance to change in terms of human resources, resistance to change to transformation. But there is a resistance to change also of the building because they opposite uh, and, and a resistance of the transformation as they are historical ones. And so I think that the key word we are really stressing uh, in this next one, in our typological upgrade, which is meant to sustainable exploitation of existing spaces, adaptive reuse and valorization is, the next one, the key word is resilience, at least yeah. uh, to us, uh, is the, the researches we are going in this uh, last period deals exactly uh, about that concept. Uh, which it means how I can predetermine the impact of new function in existing buildings in order to make this function suitable with the building itself. As all of us know, resilience has many definitions, but one that can fit our point of view in this afternoon is the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and changes and reorganize itself while undergoing change, maintaining itself in a positive path. And so what we are trying to do is to adapt, please, Elena, the resilient thinking approach to building scale. And of course, it, what does it mean? It means that the project, the project of transformation, that can be also at a little scale to transform some uh, spaces in learning spaces, uh, may mm, face a point, which is the definition of the enhancement of the amount of enhancement that we can provide taking into consideration both the lack of exploitation, if we do not nothing because we are afraid of damaging uh, the building itself, or the over-exploitation. Venice is at a city scale a really good example of over-exploitation of cultural heritage. So the point is to define threshold 
and um, arguably from in a um, in a numerical approach not only by the divination of the designer so the next one uh, this can be also seen, I will go really quick about that, but also in the two scale and two direction metrics, uh, taking into consideration conservative of transformative actions facing with uh, valorization or lack of valorization itself. So the next one. Uh, and another uh, topic over that resilience is that personally speaking, I really agree with Long, which is in 2006, right, that uh, learning space is a human requires a human-centered design approach. I think that all architecture should require a human-centered design approach. What does it mean? A design approach, approach focused on the requirements of the users. Uh, and Speaking about learning space, this means coordinating architecture, so the physical space and technology, uh, as technology may lead us in a virtual space that has to be an instrument, a tool, not the final uh, goal of the learning space. As you two already told, technology is an instrument. It's not the final objective. The final objective is learning. The final topic is learning and also determining what activities the space must, must support and it is the key to try to obtain an effective design. The next one, uh, there are many rules, but of course uh, not one may fit for every building because every building, if we speak about historical building, is a case study by itself. It's a kind of prototype of, of itself. But we can speak about um, helpful spaces, stimulating spaces, spaces that can balance community and, private, uh, and privacy and also adaptability. Uh, these are kind of general requirements what the learning space uh, should have, also in an historical building, of course. The point, the next one, is, okay, we can synthesize in comfort and uh, uh, the next, uh, Elena, sorry, uh, has some animation inside, and usability. Uh, and also we can uh, see the same uh, topic <coughs> in a much more graphical point in the next slide. And when in, see, sorry, uh, when in literature we speak, we speak about high performance workplace, it means uh, workplace that can push uh, users of these planes to the limit of their performance in terms of intellectual performance, learning performance, and so on. And in this sketch, we see about speaking about natural light, uh, internal comfort, um, ability to create inside of the space large team environments. And so all these requirements may be translated into much more engineeristic, sorry, <laughs> And the, the natural yeah. engineer comes out in the next in the next slide. The way of engineer <laughs> see reality yeah. is something yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah. And so taking into consideration, for instance, the blue ones, the threshold on transformation, it means that if we need to play, place a new use, we have to de, to predetermine impact about the in the space in terms of connected system plans dimension, and also taking into consideration other topics like accessibility, because we have to put, to let people come inside, safety. So the next one is in a much more uh, architectural way, <laughs> trying to make a balance between uh, uh, constraints of the buildings and transformation that are required by the function itself. And this balance has to be uh, or in balance between transformation and constraints, or if it is not in balance, at least the designer has to understand that it is an unbalanced system, yeah. and how to determine if this balancing is uh, acting correctly or not, to our perspective, by definition of a resilience limit, the next one, and I go quite quickly to the uh, closer, uh, the next one. Uh, I will skip, uh, of course, this detail, but I, I represent it is just to underline how complex yes. this process may be, taking into consideration what in Italian we say an antinomy, something that may be in contradiction one mm -hmm. to, uh, to each other. And uh, we have developed a methodology, the next one, that we are applying 
uh, as experimental sites to our to some of our historical buildings uh, to determine in a quite easy way the impact of new function in existing buildings and try to guarantee a sustainable transformation of it. What we do is by means of two parameters, the next one is one of them, which is a synthetic a graphical uh, way to determine the performance, the level of performance that the building has before the transformation mm -hmm. uh, in terms of usability, comfort, safety, accessibility, conservation and flexibility. These, these six terms are evaluated in uh, a mathematical way, so no judgment, but just evaluation of something that can be uh, shared and in a scientific approach. And this scores determines the level of performance of the building, of adequacy of the building to a function. In the next one, we see how we match these six parameters that we see also as drivers of change, because if we have a lack of comfort, we have to push the comfort level, for instance, to what is required yeah. to the users, and how to mix them and to check them with some with eight control variables. This is a kind of specific language of uh, resilience thinking approach, and these control variables have negative four of them or positive four other of them impact on the building. So in the next one, uh, by means a kind of cross evaluation of the six transformation driver and of eight control variable, we can determine, in a, let's say, in a controlled manner, uh, the impact of the new function on the building itself. The red, of course, is the bad, and the green is yeah. the good, in terms of impact of single action of transformation. And what we are doing uh, by now, and I hope we can share in a further opportunity the first results of these studies is also applying this methodology to um, learning spaces, for instance, because, of course, they have a set of functions that are quite specific. The next one, which is the last one, of course, uh, the point is try to look for a new sustainable uh, reuse strategy for existing abandoned university spaces, these two pictures. Uh, refers to both of the two, to some spaces of the university, which are abandoned. So we have a huge patrimony also of empty spaces that can be um, not only refurbished, but restored. And we hope to do so in a sustainable way, also in a learning perspective approach. So thank you for your time. Marco, really, thank you very much for your contribution, because um, uh, your contribution, let me think. <laughs> Uh, just about the fact of a, a, a double way uh, to watch and to observe the university as from one side, uh, in, just in the, in, the, in, the, in the case of a University of Pavia, long established university with an ancient building from one side, so we can, like a picture is a, a photography of a situation, but from the other side, we have a university continuously changing in their evolution and in, in expectation from the uh, academic corpus, from students, from uh, employees, uh, from uh, teaching, from a professor, for needs, in terms of mission, for example, yeah. for museum. And about the fact that we have to observe this situation, observe mm -hmm. the concept of resilience, and that go on in a sort of balancing in which you show us some deliverables and, yeah. um, and some concrete and practical uh, instruments and tools in order to manage uh, this uh, situation. Yeah. So really, thank you very much thanks. for your thanks. presentation. Thanks, Helena, and thanks you all. And now I leave the floor to Mats Kuled from Uppsala. Thank you, Helena. Uh, he will uh, um, be represent you, uh, experiences and uh, situations and coming from Sweden. To, to, so to Mats, the remember. floor is Take yours. Um, I'm going to present to you uh, one specific case uh, which is the experimental classroom at Uppsala University, um, a quite new room, nine years old by now, and how it has been used. Um, Uppsala has lots of teaching spaces. Uh, this image, actually, we haven't got quite this far in winter yet, it's still a grey November. Um, here you have one of the oldest buildings of Uppsala University, the Gustavianum, with this fantastic onion shaped dome, which also houses the oldest learning space in Uppsala University, the anatomical theater. 
uh, from the late 17th century and a wonderful example of an historical learning space, beautifully built for its purpose with a maximum concentration on what is going down at the center of the room, um, good lighting from the dome above, and space for lots of people and all have an unhindered view of what is going on. It's a lovely example, I think, of a learning space, an historical learning space. And the experimental classroom is one of the modern learning spaces then. It's housed in the campus Blåsenhus, as it's called, where, among other things, the teacher training uh, of the university is housed. The experimental classroom is suspended, so to say, in mid-air in the major entrance hall of the campus. And from the outside, it looks like this, with glass walls, a circular room hanging in mid-air like this. It is a spectacular uh, hall, you could say. And I think what um, Margot said about the symbolic value of rooms is extremely important. We have the historical rooms, like the anatomical theater, for example. And in the experimental classroom, we have noticed how um, this very this very aspect of the room, the spectacular room, all the walls and glass hanging in midair, makes a distinct impression on the students, makes them curious, makes them interested in what is going to happen here. And so space works in this way. It creates expectations. Uh, and you could also say it also creates challenges for the teachers to live up to these expectations. One could remember that too. Um, it is also the classroom, an, ex an example of what Stefan had said about the rule of leadership. Um, this whole grew out of a cooperation with Stanford University originally, where they had an early uh, flexible classroom with lots of technology. And the then vice chancellor of the University of Uppsala uh, grasped the opportunity and set things in motion to make the experimental classroom in Uppsala possible. And then since then, since 2010, it has been open to teachers and students of the university. And um, the, uh, uh, the, hall, the room itself is quite flexible. All furniture, of course, rolls around on wheels, tables, chairs, and so on. There are eight screens in all. There are four of them are interactive whiteboards. And then there are four other large normal screens, eight projectors, all in all. And the room is also flexible in other ways. There's a sort of sliding glass wall, which can be, you can divide the room into two halves with perfect sound insulation between them in a matter of five minutes, during the coffee break, for example, in the middle of a lecture or a seminar. So it is a, a really flexible room. And all the technology that can be controlled from the wall panels or from a portable iPad. Um, our points of departure for working with the experimental classroom are these. Um, it is um, uh, a common resource for the university. All teachers are welcome there. And of course, at the center, I think that is, which I think we all gathered here today are united in this, aren't we? That it is, should be the pedagogy and not the technology, which is at the center of things everywhere. Um, beyond that, some important points which I think has contributed to making the experimental classroom um, the success that I think you can say it has been. Um, one point is about the accessibility, lowering thresholds for teachers, for faculty, making it easy for them to come here. It is free to use. We are aware of other parallel rooms with this, or similar, uh, the similar equipment in other universities where the, 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 the amount of money you have to pay to use the room is exorbitant, which means that it will be lie empty. This is seen as some of the common resources of the university already paid for, so it's free to come here, provided that you, as a teacher, are prepared to set something um, at stake, that you want to change something, that you want to develop something. Um, we have a simple online booking calendar. You can immediately find free time slots. You fill in an online form. And then you get a reply from us with the first, as a first point of contact. We'll contact you and we set up a meeting with you. So making it simple to access for faculty. We always provide lots of support, generous support, 
both pedagogical support uh, and technical support. And uh, as far as we can, we are always present in the room, actually. We, we sit by, we observe uh, when it is needed, we step forward and help out if something with technology, for example, needs uh, assistance. Um, but otherwise, we are there as a sort of reassuring presence and also to, in order to observe, of course, what goes on. Um, we wish this to be an encouraging setting for faculty. We know that many teachers are challenged when they come to this room and they see all the screens, eight screens. So how, what on earth am I supposed to do with eight screens? Uh, what can I do here? Um, yes, this is about development. This is about ex experimenting. But we also try to um, we discuss with them. We depart from their teaching. What do they think is important within their subject? What are their experiences from their courses? And then we can start talking about what other teachers before them have done here in this room. Try to connect that and make it more um, realistic for them to see, OK, you can actually do this and it went all right. Perhaps I could do something similar like this. So we want this to be an encouraging, a stimulating room where it is needed, sort of a pleasure to come there as a teacher. And the last fourth point, what they do here should be transferable. They should be able to take things back to their own campuses uh, without any problems. This is not a room with cutting edge technology. It is a spectacular room, yes. But technologically, uh, interactive whiteboards have been around for more than 20 years. Uh, and a large number of screens isn't in itself anything remarkable. Um, and this is actually a choice on our part. We want to uh, show the teachers what can be done with technology, which isn't actually that far away, which is affordable, uh, but which is perhaps just that step beyond what they are normally used to do to use in their own campus settings. And that I think that is an important point, making it possible for them. We do not have augmented reality. We do not have virtual reality. We do not have 3D printers. We have, there are such things in other campuses at the university. But this is another type of room. And as a point of illustration, our most remarkably successful piece of technology is actually these called catch boxes, a throwable, a throwable microphone. This is a fantastic gadget in itself. It is inexpensive. Instead of passing along microphones in the room, which takes about 50 to 60 students, you throw them a microphone like that. It's a soft cushion, you could say. Uh, fantastic. Uh, and it is also, it works invariably as a sort of icebreaker. Nervous students get relaxed when they start throwing microphones to each other, as long as there aren't too many coffee cups around on the tables, that is. Um, and also, their voices carry, which is, of course, the main point of the microphone. All voices get heard in this way, the ease of it. I think it is a, a lovely example of how technology works very well. Uh, the process for receiving teachers in the room, in brief, uh, we, we start always with a sort of pre-meeting, discussing, as I said, departing from their current teaching in their courses, what they find, uh, what students do find interesting, what challenges they find as teachers, um, what they want to improve, what they want to develop. And then we explore, we talk about examples from other teachers. And then we move on to planning what they are supposed to do. And then we train them. We, we want them to know exactly what they need to know in order to carry out their plan. We leave the rest. They can come back to that later if they want to learn more. But we only take up as much of the technology that they actually need to use. Um, so we, uh, then the students come with their teacher uh, and we sit in, we observe what goes on and the teacher teaches the students and the students work. Afterwards, we make a follow-up analysis. Okay, what, what was a success? <laughs> what was a flop? What went wrong? That happens. Um, why did that occur? How could we avoid that? And how could we improve the strong points and so on? And some teachers then uh, start back into a new plan and go round and down like that. And sooner or later, we will have to tell them, OK, it has been wonderful having you here, but lots of teachers want to come to this common resource of the university. You have to move back to your own campus. How can we help you achieve the things which you have done here in the experimental classroom in your normal campus setting? How can you adapt the course? 
how can you perhaps also adapt the teaching learning spaces at your, your own campus as a consequence of what you have done here? And then we have, that's one of the problems, we also have, I confess, teachers who do not develop. They find a model like this and then they just come back and do the same thing and they are content and the students are content and from one point of view that is good but from our point of view which is the developmental aspect of the whole this may sometimes turn out to be a problem um, of course you saw the empty room before this is how we like it to be it to be seen and you could say the main points of the room which we have seen recurring over and over again revolve a couple of set points the flexibility of the room which provides the teachers of the flexibility in their teaching and to planning new teaching scenarios. We have the activities, that is, get the students to do the work. Uh, of course, you need to use the technology as a teacher, but above all, get the students up on their legs, let them take over, let them use the, the, um, uh, the technology, that is important. Uh, we have the documentation aspect, that what the students do, what they create, this is a creative environment, can also be saved. So they bring things with them together, which they have produced together in the hall. They bring them with them. And we also have a fourth aspect, which is the connectivity, connecting to other rooms. Uh, it isn't, doesn't appear here, but there are cameras in the room. We can connect easily to other rooms by video conference or other technologies. Those four aspects are the central ones, I think. And these are a couple of different, uh, this was, um, a class of art historians, for example, a lovely class. They went, they were the only ones actually on the first day of the course, of the beginner's course of art history. And they took away most of the tables and chairs and they milled around, around the room, 70 students, and they wanted to talk about what is art because they wanted to set the tone for the entire course. This is how we want to talk about art together. We wanted to be um, an, an open ended discussion um, where all contribute at their own level. A uh, sort of informal, ongoing discussion, and it worked marvelously. And it set, they came back later and said that they had achieved what they wanted on that single occasion, actually. They set a tone for discussion which lived on for the run of the course. And there are other examples here which I could delve into. I mean, lots about it is, about, of course, about students being activated, students using technology, students fetching material, students uh, creating mashups and, 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 and uh, bringing together materials from different sources and introducing them to their fellow students and so on. Um, so how, how far have we come here uh, after nine years with teachers in the experimental classroom? Uh, to summing it up, I would say yes, we have mostly enthusiastic teachers, not all of them. Uh, there are a couple of teachers come here once or twice and then say thank you very politely um, and then they return to their campuses and they don't come back most of them do come back they wish to they wish to come back and um, they some of them take very small steps from an outward point of view but when they say when they tell us how that has changed their courses you realize that sometimes even very small changes uh, can drastically alter the amount of student activity and student learning in the classes simple basic functions of the interactive whiteboards like that you can be write directly into a powerpoint that is incredibly simple stuff and that deeply transformed one particular course for medical students for example uh, where the level of engagement in the discussion and, and the number of students taking part in the discussions increased drastically when the students actually had to finish the teacher's PowerPoint by stepping forward and writing in, in all the text into the PowerPoint, which normally would have been put there in advance. So the students are also, most of them, enthusiastic and active. We have seen that uh, sometimes when a teacher does too little in the hall, the students have had their expectations raised by coming to this spectacular room and then the, the teachers don't do very much, they don't use the technology, that can at all, that can sometimes be counterproductive and the students get disappointed. But mostly students really enjoy and they enjoy taking command and using the technology and creating things in there. We have acquired this broad base of experiences which serves us very well in our general work with educational development, whether it is in the experimental classroom or when we move around over the university. 
And we saw also this spreading effect. We were afraid that the hall would be, the experimental classroom would be a sort of ivory tower of glass, <laughs> a unique hall within the university. But now we've seen the teachers who have been here are now driving development in their own campuses. New rooms are growing up, some of them quite new rooms, newly built, and some of them also built into existing learning spaces. And we had teachers from different departments who have come here, who have taught here, and they go back and they create new learning spaces. They create new informal learning spaces, which Marco talked about. And um, we have seen this clear spreading now. It's slow up to work in the beginning, but now it's taking uh, pace. Challenges, as always with e-learning, don't we know it all, uh, reaching beyond the early adopters. We have people coming back. Uh, we have fewer, perhaps, uh, new teachers coming here. Um, sometimes it's difficult to say no to teachers who continue to come here but do not develop their model, which I talked about earlier. We have to tell them sooner or later, either you go on developing your course or you have to move back and make space for other teachers. Fighting rumors may sound strange, but only after a year or two we heard con very conflicting rumors out on the campus areas. Some said, oh, that hall, that is always booked. You can ne it's impossible to get there, which was false. You could come there. And then we had, at the same time, another room going around. Oh, that room, always empty, waste of money. And how these rumors grew initially, we don't know. But you have to keep an eye on the, this, how this room or similar rooms get talked about. And one aspect, uh, that is, we have not been able to let our observations and our collect the collected experiences here develop into evidence-based and research-based. Uh, that is for simple reasons, we are part technically of the university administrations. We aren't even permitted to carry out research. We have to try to bring researchers to the room. That has been a stumbling block. We haven't been able to do that, but we hope to do so in the near future. We have a project uh, going on now, which we hope will bring that. So, uh, Elena talked about space as a product, and we think it's also space as an agent, uh, as you said, it shapes learning behavior. We have seen this. If the teachers take the initiative and produces a direction in the, in that, in the productive behavior, otherwise it can also happen very little. But it is really, we have really been impressed with how space is a major factor in influencing student behavior. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Matt, for very disinteresting uh, experience, uh, practical, uh, practical and successful uh, experience from uh, uh, Uppsala uh, University for your um, uh, experience and on the field approach, uh, concrete, and from your pedagogical approach uh, that I think is really uh, a driver for change. Um, I noticed just maybe a couple of questions uh, in the chat, if you maybe can uh, go through uh, the chat, because the first one, maybe for Matt, how do you work with the cross-action spaces? There is a question. And before, uh, if I don't fail, uh, there was a question about uh, uh, your experience I and the great here. numbers. Um, Maybe if you go through uh, the, um, the chat, you can answer uh, this kind auditories. of, um, of a question, uh, Matt. Let's see here. Uh, uh, yes, if you, uh, uh, do you have up? an experience with designing auditories uh, or rooms for many students? Yes, uh, we have. Okay. We, we, have a, help you. we have a quite new room right now built in the campus of the English Park, which is the humanities campus. It's called the Humanistic Theatre. There's one other uh, spectacular exactly. room, which, has, which seats around 150 people. Uh, it is uh, quite new construction. It has also been equipped with a sound system, horribly expensive, I, I admit, but which makes it possible to carry out a, a dialogue even in a room with as many as 150 people. It picks up sound from wherever you are sitting and wherever you sit in the room, you can actually hear what other people are saying, in, though they use their normal tone, the, the, the level of voice. And we have also helped with 
uh, giving advice to uh, other campuses who have been refitting old halls. And I think one important aspect of that, I think Marco touched on this, that when you do start building new rooms or refitting old rooms, you have to have the whole set of people with you from the beginning. You have to have the, the teachers and the faculty which will use the rooms. You have to have the education developers who have the broad perspective often and experiences. You also have to have the technologists and the support staff which will be support the teachers there. And you have to have the building the responsible for buildings and architecture and, and that type of technology all to get working together from the outset. That will save you lots of trouble, really. Um, there are other questions. Um, accessibility there. The catch box is other than as a gimmick. Yes, it is a gimmick in the way which I talked, but it also it, it, it is actually the most the easiest way of quickly giving a, a, a student access to microphone, being able to make themselves heard. It, it's, it's very simple in that way. It's fantastically uh, um, effective in that way. Um, uh, the cross action spaces, um, if I understand that correctly, is that where you where you interact with other rooms, simply connect to other rooms and other spaces? Is that what you meant, Eva? cross-actions basis. Eva, can you give maybe um, some uh, more details uh, to, to, to Matt in order that he can better answer uh, to your question? If you are online. Yeah. So I think okay. that was... Okay, maybe you can you answer with a more general <laughs> answer, uh, Matt, if you have not all the detail you want. Okay, Mats, maybe uh, Stefano and uh, Marco, do you want to, to have some interaction with uh, Mats about the uh, experience? No, I, I'm very interested in uh, uh, what you just oh. say that uh, you have now the experience uh, for a room for 150 people, uh, which uh, was not at the time we visited you, right? Uh, and. Uh, Maybe in the, in the next year I will come to visit you to see because the, that is something that is very yes. much needed in our case for the humanistic studies. The dimensions that, are so uh, um, in general to, to that the, size the or more. Uh, I'll, so I'm very I'll much interested to see how it works practically. Thank you very much, very much, Matt. Okay, so I, I really think that uh, some uh, minutes uh, remain just uh, to show in a nutshell uh, the situation and uh, the uh, learning space of uh, Favia. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christina, for your loading. Okay. Uh, I have to say that uh, the learning space of Pavia was uh, built and inaugurated on March uh, 2017, if I uh, well remember. So it is uh, quite a young uh, learning uh, space. And I would like just here to share with you the process undertaken by the University of Pavia in order to plan uh, these spaces and uh, the services, uh, the needs assessment, uh, the use, uh, and the level of the achievement uh, that uh, we have just one year after the uh, inauguration of uh, our uh, space. Of course, uh, when we um, felt uh, uh, the, the, the necessity uh, to, to build and to have such kind of uh, new learning space, we wanted to set in the scene another time and uh, we wanted to, to build just a pedagogy space technology framework for designing and evaluating learning space. Just we want to uh, relate uh, three main uh, terms uh, and the concepts again uh, in order to foster, um, have a new kind of pedag pedagogy um, 
sustained by technology uh, using one space and as you can see uh, in this uh, framework uh, each of these three topic influences uh, the other in order that if a pedagogy uh, is uh, enlarged by technology technology from its side extend uh, the space and you can as you can understand with another time virtual space embedded space uh, uh, internet of things uh, cloud computing uh, and so on and this new kind of spaces encourages again a new kind of pedagogy and the the same as you can read uh, this framing in the opposite uh, sense Pedagogy can be enabled by the space, so the space can embed the technology, like just in this moment, and the technology from its side can enhance a new kind of pedagogies. So this was the framework uh, that we in Pavia tried uh, to observe uh, during the planning uh, of our experience in our university. And... Uh, just to be sure to have the correct path in order to implement and to plan the learning spaces, we um, go through. We went through uh, some kind of uh, uh, professional and in literature present toolkit, a special toolkit that can help uh, a team in order to plan, uh, develop, develop and achieve uh, a learning space. Um, this is one of the toolkit uh, present uh, and uh, readable on uh, the internet <clears throat> for people that want to implement such kind of resource. And this is a resource for designing and sustaining technology-rich informal learning spaces. And you can read there uh, the internet uh, address. So if you want, uh, you can uh, reach the address and look at all the uh, really great resources that you can have, not only from a point of view of uh, suggestions uh, and notes uh, and handbook, but practical assistance in order that you have deliverables, uh, graphics, examples, uh, in order to help people in going through uh, all the process. You can see here uh, a sort of map uh, so you can start from a general uh, roadmap when you have, uh, how can I say, the big picture. So we started from here, so from the idea uh, to build a learning space and to keep together all the stakeholders and the needs. So the idea was as a first step to keep together all the needs, the people, the offices, uh, the achievement that we want uh, to uh, obtain at the end uh, of our work. And then uh, the second very important point uh, were the uh, needs assessment. That is the idea to sit around the table and to talk um, with uh, all the stakeholders what kind of needs uh, do we want to uh, to to, to obtain uh, which kind of needs we want to satisfy in a learning uh, the, the learning uh, space and then uh, we put together like just in this uh, um, picture which kind of space which kind of technology for which kind of needs of course which kind of services to implement uh, inside the new learning space and then with choosing the space, choosing the technologies, and choosing and identifying the services, we obtain a level of integration of the spaces, the technologies, and the service in order to go through and fin finalize all the process in the implementation of uh, the learning space. Saying in this way, it seems so, so easy uh, to go through to the process and to obtain uh, the result, uh, we, in this table, was uh, the main stakeholder of uh, this learning space, and we can uh, really um, say that it was so difficult to go through to this uh, process because it was not at all uh, easy to identify, for example, the services, to identify and change uh, the space, to identify which kind of technology, 
and to mix and match them in a sort of integration just to uh, arrive and to finalize for to the implementation process. So it is not easy at all. Oh, sorry. So this was the uh, starting situation, uh, the uh, initial situation, uh, a long uh, and uh, empty uh, room uh, with a lot, as you can see there, um, building constraint uh, that we cannot change. But we tried during the implementation and during the planning to use this constraint as opportunities uh, in order to change and, and in order to uh, build the new learning space. It was a unique uh, room, an empty and unique room, in which we were, we were able to define this new situation. We define this space in which you can see three different rooms um, separated with the uh, walls uh, made by uh, glass. And uh, this uh, glass is a special uh, glass against uh, uh, noise. So we can have a kind of situation that is in the um, larger room, we can have more people that can uh, have a, a lecture or, or a traditional lecture or a more innovative uh, lecture using technology. And then uh, people there can split and have a project work or a refining their, their works or refining the lesson in other two different uh, small, smaller uh, rooms. And then, ca they, then uh, they can go together again in the larger room to have a plenary session together in order to discuss. Each of the room has interactive boards. These interactive smart boards have a personal computer on board with the camera and connected to the internet. So you can have a web conference, you can have interaction, and each of the smart board can work separately or can work simultaneously between them. So you can have one only environment of learning and teaching, or separately three different environments in which to work. So this is the first idea. The second idea was to separate the previous unique room and identify uh, a room in which four people can work in multimedia production. So in this room, we have a specialist um, technician that are able to work on audio video production. And the idea is what we can see and what we can show in the room number one, we have previously seen in the previous slide, then we can refine and revise and product in this second room. And as a third room here, we created absolutely not at 16 before a recording studio in which to have a recording production. So we can have your cameras and the special furniture in order to produce audio video production like this. Uh, here in less, less than one year, we were able to produce 300 um, video clip in order to produce online master, online uh, activities, online special path. And we can produce here, post produce in the middle room, observe in the first room in a sort of re-engineering process in, in which we can observe, produce, post produce, revise and restart the process. These were um, at the beginning the idea of the governance of uh, our university because the involved stakeholders for the project was of three kinds a strategy level, the management level, and the practitioner level. So we have just to start, uh, how can I say, a top-down commitment just to, to start in order to have our first, we can say, uh, learning space called Kirolab. It is a sort of laboratory for learning and teaching uh, uh, matters. And uh, in, uh, in, in this commitment, uh, we realized the fact that there was a strong need in order to produce and post-produce uh, audio-video audio uh, material resources and didactical resources 
to produce online path or just for on, fully online uh, path or for blended uh, activities. So uh, the we have uh, from the strategy level this kind of, it, un of input and of course an input of new kind of uh, pedagogies in order to be realized in this new space. Then it was involved the management level that is the central professional services uh, who will be in charge uh, to, uh, to manage uh, this uh, space. And as a third and uh, of a paramount uh, importance level, the practitioner level, that is individual academics, a representative of students, and the people with ideas in order to change, to foster innovative um, learning and teaching approach. So going together, uh, we were able to have a roadmap, the roadmap that you view in a, in a previous uh, slide, and put down the idea on some papers and starting uh, the um, planning of, uh, of our uh, learning space. Finally, uh, uh, okay, this is a long list, but really you cannot forget to uh, identify and to involve each of us because it's very, very important in this list a lot of uh, matters, a lot of problems, a lot of points of view are identified and highlighted by Marco are here present. Managing the IT and electrical infrastructure, managing the fabric of the buildings, uh, providing uh, technical support for the space. If you don't have in the, in the team uh, these kind of people with this kind of, this kind of competencies, um, maybe your project uh, has some problems uh, in order to be efficient and complete at the end. Uh, so, for, for example, we had a lot of interview with the uh, um, personnel and the people of our university able to uh, organize events and conferences. Um, we have a, a connection with the students and academic services events, people working in students and academic service and events, because, for example, we here have a lot of web conference um, in order to make a great process of internationalization of the University of Pavia, linking both physical and virtual events. Uh, we have here a very strong process of managing and supporting all the people that come here in search of assistance, in search of ideas. So there is here a great group of competence, uh, competencies, competent people in order to assist uh, teaching, in order to assist the students, in order to assist external people coming from example from companies, coming from other institutions that want uh, to develop here their uh, initiatives. Uh, so, please believe me, all this list of stakeholders were included and were interviewed or were, um, we were uh, really uh, keen to listen to their opinion in order to uh, have uh, their point of view on this learning space. And uh, I have to say, uh, we can say, it works. Uh, here in this picture, you can see the rector of the University of, of Pavia writing the word innovazione, that is innovation, on our smart board. We um, host here um, a lot of web conferences uh, with the uh, external world, with the European um, um, uh, countries. We have here a special um, events uh, and uh, pa learning path uh, with uh, Libya, with Libyan students uh, that are uh, keen to learn uh, Italian uh, language. So we have here, uh, come here every week, uh, um, uh, a teacher of Italian language. Uh, it is in this way in connection uh, with the Libyan student uh, in order to give him their uh, lesson. We have here a live uh, event. And uh, above all, we have here active learning and uh, different classroom in order to foster innovation in didactics and innovation in the, in the way to present um, new kind of classroom, new kind of classroom fostered by technology, new kind of classroom fostered by a, a new way to produce uh, innovation in a pedagogical aspect. We are quite satisfied. 
and uh, in this uh, so we are on the idea to create uh, the second uh, learning space in the University of Pavia in the center in the heart of our university in an historical building so this together with Marco will be a real challenge because uh, this new building is really fully of a constraint and the second situation will be uh, really very very difficult more than the first because it is uh, in an historical building that is very very difficult to have uh, changes and um, to act as we as we would to act in introducing technology but uh, since uh, the first uh, example were uh, so successful for us we absolutely uh, wanted to achieve uh, the second result and uh, so we can say that the experience of Pavia in this field uh, is quite good. Uh, students are really enthusiastic when come here. Um, also professor, I can uh, observe uh, all the problems, the troubles and the point that highlighted the Stefano. Uh, there, there is resistance. Uh, there is a resistance to change. Uh, maybe people uh, want to be accompanied in this process. Uh, the teacher and the professor are never alone. We are there together with us in order to help them in uh, undertake a new situation and in undertake new kind of make new kind of pedagogical approach. And if the professor have this kind of support, uh, we see that uh, it comes the first time and then the second and then the third. And from the professor and from teacher come more and more ideas uh, in order to go on and to have uh, more implementation, different implementation that, for example, we didn't think at uh, the beginning. Um, it is quite uh, commit a commitment uh, way. Uh, the group here working is working hard in order to support this, but we think that this is the future. And uh, I really appreciate the approach of Mats in order to create one space and try to use the experience to have dissemination for other spaces in university as, and for other spaces in other universities. And so I will uh, take um, such kind of approach by Mats as uh, a good approach also to share here in University of Pavia. Uh, Okay, I, I think uh, I have finished uh, my time. <laughs> and if there are uh, questions or um, uh, comments, uh, we are here uh, available for you. Uh, okay, uh, maybe Christina, uh, you wanted to say something or uh, to close? Uh, we are uh, running out of time. Okay, this is the comments of uh, Christina. <laughs> so really, I want to thank uh, all the participants of this webinar. I want to thank uh, Mats for having shared with us uh, the experience from Uppsala. And uh, thank you very much.